Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is an entrepreneur, educator, speaker, and author. She has started and managed two for-profit and two not-for-profit companies, and she has traveled to 35 states and eight foreign countries. Recognized in who's who in education and who's who in literature, she utilizes skills built up over decades as she reinvents herself with her award-winning fourth book and debut novel, The Eve as well as with a return to one of her early loves, radio. She brings that quest for a good story and a drive to keep contributing to her radio show, The Storytellers, broadcast on Authors on the Air Global Radio Network and rated their second best viewed podcast. Each episode captures the stories of authors and others who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. She is also the host of Launchpad, the radio show that celebrates book releases and the authors that create them. She currently lives on Florida's West Coast with her husband and a small herd of imaginary llamas. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Grace Salmon. Julia, thank you for that beautiful introduction and for all the care that you take in this wonderful podcast yourself. It's such an honor to be here with you. Well, Grace, this is a case of a podcaster interviewing a master podcaster. So thank you for being with us. I'm honored. Our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, so what took you so long to write a book? Well, as you so kindly mentioned in your introduction, The Eves, my novel, is my fourth book, but it took me a long time to write it. I think that for many of us, the process is a slow one, at least with the first novel. When I wrote my first book, which was over 20 years ago now in the field of education, I wrote that in like six months. I don't know. I sat down. It was my sole mission in life. And then my other two books came relatively quickly after that. But my novel, The Eves, is really something that I had to puzzle out because my character, Jessica Barnett, was really at this crossroads in her life, trying to decide where is she going to go now that she doesn't have some of those traditional roles of mother, daughter, worker. And I was at that same point, so I needed to puzzle it out a little bit. It just took me longer to write it. Well, we want to hear more about your imaginary llama herd. (laughs) Well, I think in an ideal world, and I certainly try to create that in my novel, the world that I wanted to create, as you'll see in the eaves, there are llamas and sheep, and it's this fabulous house on top of the Chesapeake Bay, which is one of my most favorite parts of the world. And unfortunately, I realize I'm never going to have a real herd of llamas. So a friend of mine said, oh, just tell everybody you have imaginary llamas. It'll be a great conversation (laughs) piece. And it is. And and where I live now, I couldn't possibly, but I still have this fantasy that maybe one day I'll have a llama or two. They're great animals. They're super easy to keep. Do you have any on your farm? You should have llamas on your ranch. We don't, but but you're making me interested in those. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they're absolutely wonderful. We have lots of deer and raccoons and large hogs and, of course, my dogs. So we have a lot of animals to look over. Grace, you are certainly an overachiever with two podcasts and writing books at the same time. Can you tell us about your time management skills? What is a 
typical, if there is such a thing, day in the life of Grace Salmon? Oh, you're far too kind. I don't know if I'm an over, I would never say I was an overachiever. I think it's at the heart of who I am is that entrepreneurial spirit. I love to create things. I love to collaborate with others. I love to lift other people up. So a typical day for me is, oh, I don't know. I I don't know if I have a typical day. Yesterday was spent on a new venture that I'm working on. You mentioned my radio show, Launchpad, which is brand new. We've only had one episode and we are booked through the first of the year, which we're delighted about. But I have this idea that since I am celebrating authors and the books they create, I should also somehow connect with people who are perhaps struggling to write a book. So I had this idea, and I'm very excited about it. On March 20th, I wrote to my colleague, Mary Helen Sheriff, who is the head of Bookish Road Trip, where I spend lots of time on Facebook. And I wrote to her and I said, let's write a book series. And the book series should be tied to the radio show. We'll call it Launchpad, the countdown to writing your book, Launchpad, the countdown to publishing your book, and Launchpad, the countdown to marketing your book. And within two days, Mary and I had locked down all the details. We had partnered with Red Pegwood Books and the fabulous Stephanie Larkin. And yesterday, we had our first planning meeting, and we have lead authors for the three books. We are working with Emma DeHancy in Scotland. And so we're going to launch these three books. And yesterday was so different because it was not a writing day per se at all. But we laid out the books and how they're going to work and how the contributors will work. And I think our first book will be published in January. So to go from March 21st, whatever that date was, to being able to say, we're going to have a book published in January, I I couldn't be more thrilled. So for me, there's a lot of that um, creativity around writing. Unfortunately, I'm not doing enough novel writing. I am writing a lot of articles right now, which I really enjoy, but I'm not Um, sinking into the novel, the new novel, the way I thought I would. Well, I'm so excited to hear about those books, and I'm sure all of our listeners will want to rush out and get those as soon as you launch them. Thank you. Once you had to write this novel, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to use a hybrid small press, or did you self-publish? I did a variety of things. I feel so strongly about the eaves, as as I think probably most of us do. And I'm so grateful that it's trending at at least 4.7 stars on all of the platforms. And that means people take the time to not only read the book, but to tell an author and our reading community what they think about it. So on my path to publishing, I sent it out to, oh, I don't know, 50 agents. And you know so well, Julia, that in our field, you have about a 1% chance of getting an agent and then about a 10% chance of getting published after that. So that was daunting to me. And I, I waited around for a bit. And then I just thought, I need this book out now. I, I didn't want to wait. I mean, one of the great things about your show is you focus on women who not only have a big skill set because we are older, but we may be a little bit more impatient because we want our stories told. So I wound up with a wonderful small um, hybrid press in um, it's actually in Texas. Uh, it's registered in Texas is the word I was looking for. And it's Chad Robertson's Writing Nights. And he is a phenomenal person to work with. And he really pressed me a lot before he agreed to publish my book. He kept asking me why, why this book? Why now? Why um, is it important? And what do you mean by success? And that really helped my whole trajectory in publishing. Well, I think it is so wonderful that we have so many different options these days. I was like you, and I didn't want to wait, you know, two to four years to try to get an agent and try to have a traditional publisher. So I think these micro presses and these hybrid presses just offer us so much. And then those who want to self-publish as well. I I agree with you entirely. And it's very rare, although people will ask me about my path to publishing. It's very rare that somebody says, what's the name of your press? Because I don't think it has the cachet that it did Mm -hmm. 
before. Mm-hmm. It, it's the credibility of our stories. I agree. Tell us more about the inspiration for the Eves. I wanted to talk to both my younger self. So the youngest character in the book is 15. The oldest character is 94. So I wanted to project where I would be in years to come. So it's the story of the very psychologically complex Jessica Barnett. She has given up on her appearance and her career. And she's trying to rebuild this, remodel this house in Washington, D.C. And she can't quite get it all together because she's hiding from the world. She has had this horrible family calamity and she is basically hiding from the world. And she is very lucky to have a bossy friend that says to her, this is going to stop. You are going to stop hiding from the world. And I think I was like that in a way. I, I wasn't hiding to the extent that Jessica is. So I created this very complex character. And then I knew the beginning. She was complex. She felt lost. And I knew the end. It was the middle that was hard to figure out. And I think that that's probably true for many of us in life. We may not know the exact end. And there are lots of plot twists and turns in my book. So there are these plot twists. So we don't really know the full end. But I I did. I knew where I wanted it to end. And I knew where I wanted it to start. What does the title mean? The title is based on the fact that Jessica meets these diverse, ditzy, and determined older women down at the Grange, which is this house that sits atop the Chesapeake Bay. And these women decidedly believe they are not done. The youngest one of the women is 70. The oldest is the 94-year-old. And they are not done. They believe they are at the beginning of starting something. So they feel very much like they are creating the type of place older women might want to live in a community. They live on a sustainable farm. So they're very much committed to the the land and taking care of it. They also believe very strongly in partnering with, for example, the community college that is part of the story. So since they are people who believe they are giving birth to something, I called it The Eves, but it wasn't the original title of the book. I will tell you that. Well, I love the idea of this place. I I would like for us all to have some type of commune and have all these women living together. I think that would be grand in our old age. (laughs) I agree. It's about creating the world that we want. And I'm interviewing so many interesting people who are in their 70s, 80s, even 90s, and they're writing beautiful work. So I I really think writing is like swimming and we can do it for the rest of our lives. I agree. Writing, editing, there are so many ways that we can stay part of this process, even though other things uh, may fail us as we age. One of my best editors, and I miss him dearly, was my dad. He passed away at 92 Mm -hmm. and he had macular degeneration. But when he was editing my books, he would have like a 50 point font on his screen and move his head so that he could read. But he was still so active literally till the day he died. And what a gift to have that in your life. And a a gift of genes, it sounds like for you. Oh, thank you so much. Why don't you read a few paragraphs for us so that we can hear your tone and voice in the book? Well, thank you. So here's the beautiful cover, The Eaves, and that takes place on top of the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm going to read you just from the opening. It's called 1800 Square Feet and a Cat. So this is the opening scene and Jessica's voice. Sonia, Eric, and I drive in silence to my house, the roof of the convertible still down. The smell of earth and manure seeps from our clothes and mingles with the crisp autumn air. Today provided so many images, statements, textures, and people to think about. Our silence is wrapped in the warm glow of Erica's camera from the back seat as she flips through the hundreds of digital images she has shot. I'm unsettled, and I can't describe it. I've dropped out of so much. I've avoided being with Sonia, especially when she has 15-year-old Erica with her. I've avoided being around the energy, self-righteousness, and that sense of immortality of youth. 
I find that it scrapes too much at the wounds of my heart. Sonia drops me off and deftly makes a three-point turn on the street made narrow by cars parked on either side. I climb the three steps to the door of my row house, and I kick still virgin plastic wrap Washington's posts to the side of the porch. There it joins weeks worth of unopened newspapers and an assortment of empty paint cans. I've been intending to trash them. Before I can get the key in the door, Sonia has stopped in front of the house, and as she sweeps that one wisp of errant hair back behind her ear, she reaches for a lipstick. Looking in the rearview mirror, she says, Jessica, I watched you today. You did not put your paint in the hands or leave your mark, but I saw you trace the hands of the others. Enough, she says. This hiding from the world stops today. It is decided. You will write about that place. That's lovely, Grace. I, I was right in the scene. I could see all of those, all those characters. Well, thank you. And leaving your mark on the world is such an important part of what I think all of our stories should be. And the scene behind you that you see are other people's handprints that um, made this amazing quilt for me. And they each left their handprint in the paint, as we just described. That scene gets replayed several times in different ways throughout the book. But then each of the people wrote a quote from my book underneath their handprint. That's so special. I was the executive director of the Craftsman's Guild in Mississippi. And so I, I love quilters and their messages, and they certainly left their mark on you as well. Indeed. Did real people inspire any of your characters? Oh, very much so. And I love being able to talk about that. The There is an older woman who just is ready to be done you know, which is the antithesis of what I want the book to be about. But she's an older woman. She feels she's done. She doesn't have anything to contribute. And she's based very much, and you would appreciate this, based on the theme for your podcast. When I met, her name is Dolores, but she is the character Elizabeth in my novel. When I met Dolores, I thought she was a very old woman. She was 70 years old. Um, she is now 90 one, I think. So obviously, I'm 69 now. And uh, she wasn't as old as I perceived her to be. But she was very much the inspiration. And in many ways, the story is Elizabeth's story. Jessica is the central character. And she goes through transitions as we want women's fiction to describe. But really, we follow a different story arc for um Elizabeth as well. And that's a very important story arc within the book. So she was probably the most vibrant of the people I lifted from real life. But then there are lots of other examples. Uh, Jessica's bossy friend, Sonia, is based on a woman I used to work with, not in terms of any part of her story, but in terms of being kind of bossy and talking in a certain way and being Latina. So uh, yes, there are definitely people I rub up against. Well, you mentioned that you are um, writing a second book, and if you ever have time to get back to it with all the other items that you have on your checklist, can you tell us more about the second book? Thank you. The working title for that is When Skeletons Fall, and it mm -hmm. is based on most of us have a backstory. And the main character in this book, whose name is Phoebe, she finds out that her husband has a very distinct backstory. And as she discovers this, it's the idea of skeletons in the closet. And it's how her life gets transformed and what she makes of it when she realizes that much of what she encountered with her husband was not actually true. Does your own family support you as a writer? Very much so. Uh, I have the best husband on the planet. And it's really funny, Julia, when I, people ask me about my characters, and I should have mentioned this earlier on, they say to me, I love your book because it's character rich. And that's what drives me, certainly in my own writing. But they say the only character that really isn't believable 
is the character of Roy Gillis because he's kind of too perfect. He walks in the door and he says, greetings, greetings. And he cooks and he plays trumpet and he's a handy guy around the house. He's exactly my husband. (laughs) My husband walks in the door. He says, greetings, greetings. He cooks. He does. He's not as good a cook as Roy Gillis is, but he is such a champion because two years ago when the Eves launched, I never expected to have the author life I have now. So in many ways, it's a case of art imitating life because I thought my characters were done. I thought my end point was to simply write the eaves and say, well, that's the book I always wanted to write and then go on with Merry Retirement. Little did I know that in doing an interview similar to this, the radio show owner would say to me, Grace, I really enjoyed your talk. You should have a radio show. I never envisioned a second radio show uh, until a friend of mine said, you know, I think that we should do more around helping authors market. And I went, we can do that. So I, I enjoy so much at this point having the freedom to realize I will never be done until they fold my hands in the box, you know? I do know. And I think we're driven at this age to complete everything that we want to in our lives. And I think it makes our lives so rich. And that's why I call it our lives sweetest third, because I I think it is rich and sweet and, and we can do so much and we want to pay it forward at this point and, and to help those who are coming behind us. Oh, I agree with you so much. I think for me, what's still an issue, and it's probably been an issue for me my entire life, is balance. Trying to make sure that I take the time still to connect with people, to connect with friends, to connect with real friends, not just virtual friends, which gets very easy for us, um, as you know so well, uh, when we spend so much of our author lives on social media. But to just remember that every day is precious. It truly is. And my poor husband uh, is not a good cook like your husband. He eats a lot of (laughs) PB&J sandwiches. So (laughs) he has to suffer through all of the the work that I'm doing. Well, we're so glad you're doing this work, though. It's, It's such a delight to have somebody focus on authors over 50. Grace, what do you think was the best money you've ever spent as a writer? You know, it's so funny. I I frequently say that uh, being an author is the most expensive volunteer job I've ever had. Uh, I I feel blessed every time I get a a royalty check, which, you know, have been consistent. I will not say they've been big, but they have been consistent. The best money. I'm going to answer it in two different ways. The best investment I made was not of money. It was in finding like-minded people on social media who are committed to lifting other people up. And for me, largely that home is that bookish road trip. So that's the best investment I made. The best money I spent, I think, is probably on a book trailer, similar to a movie trailer. I, I adore my book trailer. It is the thing that I believe interviewers believed I was serious about my work when they said, this is a significant trailer. Somebody has thought about this, they've invested in it, and it communicates the message in, I think, a minute, 20 seconds. So I'm a big proponent of authors having book trailers. Well, I love that. I I am such a visual person, you know, and, and even when I write, I write as though I'm uh, seeing it on the big screen. So uh, I, I love that, that you that you invested in a, a really nice book trailer. And, you know, if, if any of your listeners are interested in that, I, I'm happy to share how I did that, who I did that with, et cetera. And I'd be happy to give any information to anybody who's looking for that as an option. Great. Grace, our Last interview question is always, our writers over 50 are such a unique group. Do you have any advice for writers 50 and above? Tell your story. 
because we have a unique perspective on the world. And we're still that baby boomer generation, right? We, I forget when we, there are fewer of us than there are more of us, but right now there's still many more of us. So our stories, not only do we have such relevance, there are people who really want to hear our stories as well. And I think if we are all active and tell our stories, you know, the subline of my book is when our stories are told, everything changes. So I just encourage everybody to do it. And there's so many ways to do it. There's memoir, which is something I never used to read, Julia. And I so appreciate your story not quite being memoir, but your story being very much linked to your own history. And so I, I, I've fallen in love with memoir and the stories that they tell in ways different than novels. So there are so, so many ways for us to tell our stories as well. Well, that is certainly great advice. I feel the same way. I'm told that baby boomers will never stop working. So I think that we have a lot more to tell and a lot more to do. And I'm just proud to say that you're now one of our authors over 50. Thanks for having me, Julia. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like daily newspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.